this Congress is, and, and you guys are, you guys have the numbers, you guys are the experts, but I mean, this seems to be a new level of, of dysfunction. I wonder when you're, when you're, when you're Biden and you're the Democrat and, and you're making the case that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy, which I think is a very powerful and important case to make. I wonder if it's a little harder to make when American democracy has produced what we are watching right now on Capitol Hill. Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. We range from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I am joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Damon Linker, who writes the Substack newsletter Notes from the Middle Ground, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. Our special guest this week is Washington correspondent for ABC News, Jonathan Carl, who has written three books about the Trump administration, all great, but the most recent one is called Tired of Winning. Thank you, one and all. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining us today. Great. Thank you for having me. I loved your book. Let, let's, um, I think one of the things that you did so well is that, uh, and one thing that's so necessary in our moment is that you have reminded people of just how um, outlandish and crazy some of the things that Trump has been doing just since, just since 2021 have been. And there is, I think, a failure on all of our parts to assimilate all this. Partly it's because there's so much of it. Um, but, uh, but so, for example, um, you go, you famously in your previous uh, book, which I also recommend, um, Betrayal, uh, you talked about, you know, visiting Trump in Mar-a-Lago right after, for close, soon after nine, uh, January 6th. And questioning him about, was he worried about his vice president, um, who uh, on January 6th, uh, you know, was the, his followers were chanting, hang my, Mike Pence. His response was extraordinary. So, um, and, and you reported that, that he said, well, they were very angry, uh, you know, and, and that arguably is something that a normal person <laughs> would never say. Never. I mean, that is the mark of a sociopath, that it was, you know, he was even willing to justify his supporters' murderous rage that he was not only willing to justify, he was, he was stoking it. Anyway, you, um, but then in this new book, um, you begin by talking about his obsessions with the uh, election being stolen to the point where it seemed like you were struggling with whether he was really deranged and believed um, the craziest possible conspiracy theory. So tell us about the conversation you had with him about, well, tell us as much as you want, but about Italy gate in particular, because you seem to feel like that was the, that was the Rubicon. I mean, I had gone through in betrayal and, uh, had, had tried to chase down some of the, the, the conspiracy theories that were being pushed by, you know, by people that were, that were trying to aid Trump in his effort to, uh, to overturn the election. Uh, at that time, and I spent some time out on betrayal, truly what I thought was the most insane a theory was this idea. I mean, and there's competition for this, to be fair. Um, <laughs> right. but, but, but was this idea that um, uh, Italian spy satellites from an Italian military contractor were used to flip, pl flip votes, uh, somehow connecting with voting machines in America, to flip votes from, uh, from Trump to Biden. And that there were these two guys that were in prison in Italy um, who were the key to it all, knew all the stuff, and they were being locked up. And, and what I reported in, in Betrayal was that um, Trump had actually uh, – or, or, well, I, again, I can't say Trump himself, but the Trump White House. Chief of Staff Mark Meadows had actually – uh, sent word out to the Justice Department to investigate this, and, then, and, and, and an email had come out that he had sent to the acting attorney general, you know, forwarding this lunatic uh, write-up on, 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 on Italy Gate, but that he had also, and this, was, this had not been reported anywhere, um, that, that Meadows had asked the acting defense secretary, Chris Miller, uh, uh, to look into this, and that Miller, on a Saturday, and it's actually 
Saturday, January 2nd, which is the day of the Raffensperger call and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but but, the, but the, he actually brings in the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, a three-star general, um, and, uh, and, and asks him – uh, to uh, you know, to look into this, to activate the, the military attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Rome to somehow get a hold of these guys that are in prison to get to the bottom of whether or not there was really anything. I mean, this is bonkers stuff. So I, um, I actually asked Trump about it, and, and there's more to it, by the way. I mean, the whole the whole story, how it came into the White House, it got into the National Security Council, this crazy. I mean, anyway, it's 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 we can do a whole separate podcast on Illegate. but I asked Trump about it. And, um, you know, he just tells me about, how, you know, well, you'd have to ask Mark Meadows about that. Because Mark Meadows is a good man, really smart man, really great chief of staff. I mean, take a beat to say, no, I don't think the Italian, you know, tried to – he, all he wants to do, he doesn't want to take ownership himself, although obviously that's right. the reason why this is happening. But yeah. is, is, to, is to praise him. But, but that, that interview – so I did a, a couple of interviews with Trump after he left the White House – the very last one um, was as I was wrapping up Betrayal, and there's there's something in there that was so out there that I actually didn't even include in Betrayal because I I, I hadn't really processed it. I, I don't know. I you know look, it, it, it was an interview right before the book went to press. I was basically calling him to get his response to some of the news that I was breaking in the book, and. Um, he starts the interview, and I have this on, on, on audio tape, um, which I've included in the audio book of, of Tired of Winning in, in part. He starts uh, talking about how the states are all reassessing and looking at the election, and he, somehow he's implying that there's a way that even – he's been out of the White House now for you know, the better part of a year um, – that he's still thinking that these election results can be overturned from 2020. So that's not why I'm calling him. I'm, I, I want to ask him about this other stuff. So, so I just stop and I, and I say he, he had just put out a statement that nobody paid any attention to. Um, he didn't even have Truth Social yet. So it was just like a, you know, a statement that he put out from Mar-a-Lago that said uh, – it was actually criticizing SNL if you can imagine because you know, for being uh, biased against him. So it was not a very serious statement. It didn't get any attention. But, but at the end of it – um, Alec Baldwin and his how bad his impersonation, all this stuff. He goes on and on and on this statement. Nobody paid anything. At the very end of it, it had the words 2024 or before. Hmm. And I knew that there was this kind of QAnon, Mike Lindell idea that the election was still going to be nullified and Trump was going to go back early. But the idea that Trump would... So I asked, so I, I finally, because he, the way he's going on, I'm like, so... I see you don't really believe there's a chance that you could go back to the White House even before the next election, do you? And he just says to me, it's very similar to his response when I'm asking about Mike Pence because this is an easy thing to say. Well, of course not. Instead, he said, I could explain to you, John, but you wouldn't understand and you wouldn't even report it. Um, uh-huh. He was consumed, and, 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 I, and I go to this in some length in, in Tired of Winning, and I think it's important because it gets the state of mind. Um, he was consumed with the idea for a solid two years, and maybe is to this day, um, with the idea that the 2020 election could still be nullified and that Biden could be evicted from the White House and that he could be reinstated before another presidential election. I think he believed it. Maybe believes it to this okay. day. Okay. And do you think that that is because he is so ignorant of American history and politics and constitutional law um, and, uh, and eager and just, you know, the f- wish being the father to the thought? Or do you think it was something along the lines of, I know exactly the gravity of what I'm suggesting and I am out to blow it all up? Well, I, I, I think that there's a little bit of, of the latter to it. Uh, and I'll tell you another thing to look at. We all remember he put out now on Truth Social at the end of 2022 the statement calling for the suspension of, of the Constitution, elements yeah. of the Constitution. Look at what it was. That's, that's what we remember is he did, he did this. But why was he doing it? 
In that statement, he is basically suggesting that the election can still be overturned again. Um, that's what that statement right. was about. Um, so he called. I mean, it's amazing that we're talking about a, 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 a maybe at this point a virtual presumptive uh, Republican nominee who has on the record called for suspending the U.S. Constitution. Um, but the reason why he was talking about doing that is his obsession with overturning the 2020 election, which – and I know like, like Jack Smith has made the case – Liz Cheney's made the case uh, that Trump fully knew he lost. Um, And I'm telling you, I think he believed that he could actually get back into the White House. I don't know that these two are actually contradictory. Um, I I, and and the case that Cheney and Jack Smith and the indictment have made is that all the people close to him who presented the information, who told him that he had lost, who said that they had chased down the allegations of fraud and there was nothing there. Therefore, I mean, you could say, obviously, he should know he lost. I don't really weigh in on that question. Did he know he lost? But as he was pursuing this, this, this effort to convince the world that he had lost, and there's a reason for that, which we can get into, why, why that was so important um, psychologically to him. But that he... he he came to at least act in a way like he believed it. And to me, the biggest tell on this one is it wasn't something he was talking about publicly. It was something he was talking about ad nauseum over and over again, privately. And, you know, the public lie is a big, that's what Trump does. You want to, uh, you know, move public opinion, but it's almost like he knew that it sounded crazy. So he didn't want to talk about it. He would, he did the 2024 before it's like a hint, but as I report in, in Tired of Winning, he was talking about this over and over again with the people around him to the point where one person who spoke to me very close to him at Mar-a-Lago uh, acknowledged to me that he finally said, you know, you should really stop talking about that because people are going to think you're crazy. <laughs> this is like, a, you know, one of his aides down there. And, and you know, this is just privately. Talk about it privately. People are going to – it's like if you really think it can happen, then let it happen. But don't talk about it. <laughs> just let it happen. You know, he um, he doesn't hedge his bets. I mean, this is one of the things that you um, document really clearly in the book is that, you know, for example, um, he was all in for this audit uh, that was going to ta- that did take place in the state of Arizona. Yeah. Right. And uh, I mean, honestly, it, it does feel like Earth 2.0 where, you know, the, the group that they hire is called the Cyber Ninjas. Um, who have no experience with, um, uh, you know, auditing votes and what, okay, whatever. So, so the, the, uh, legislature of Arizona spends all this money, or maybe it was the Senate. I think you reported the Senate, yeah. the, Senate the Senate. Yeah. So they choose to spend all this taxpayer money for this enormous audit, which was ridiculous. And Trump is out there, according to your book, every day saying, this is going to show it. The, here it comes. Wait for it. And then what does he do when they finally come out with their report that actually Biden won by slightly more votes um, than they had than the initial uh, tally? I mean, he denies it. He He says the media, he says the media is so dishonest. They won't report what they found, which was all this fraud. Yeah, he acts like they did the opposite of what they did. Which just shows his willingness right. to brazenly lie about whatever's going on. But this, this, this is a. I mean, first of all, you, it's like you can't make it up. I mean, if this didn't happen, there's no way right. you'd be able to invent the notion of a of a group called Cyber Ninjas that that that, that rents out the uh, you know the big the 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 the, 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 the basketball arena. Uh, you know, to bring in all the ballots to count them out, and they've got people looking at with infrared light to see if there's bamboo in the paper because bamboo. <laughs> if, if ballots were flown in from China, they would have bamboo, and you know, I mean, it's it's just of course it's they just, would. You know, Plus you chopsticks, yes. You just can't make up any <laughs> of this stuff. Um, but but what 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 I had reported was that he. So the, the, the Senate Republicans, this was a government funded effort, although they had to, then they started getting private funding um, from, you know, all these kind of uh, Sidney Powell's group actually uh, helped, helped. Fund yeah. it. Um, and but 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 they they had agreed to allow in the interest of transparency, uh, OAN, One American News, 
uh, the, the the total Trump sycophantic, uh, uh, I, I don't want to call it a news channel, but but channel, um, to yeah. have a live stream, a 24-7 live stream, so you could watch what was going on on the floor as the ballots were being gone through. So Trump... Must have been great entertainment, right? Trump watching was like, I think people might have been the only guy actually watching, and he was. <laughs> and, 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 and the only reason why I know this is, you know, pe- people told me about it. Nobody was interviewing Trump during this time. I mean, Fox, there was basically a Trump blackout. You know, and they, they, they didn't right. want anything to do with him. Um, he, he was off Twitter. You know, there was... He, he, had, he, had, he, was, he was in exile in Mar-a-Lago. And... But... One of the ways that you can find get, get a little bit of an insight into actually his actual words is you know while you know Mar-a-Lago has to make money he's got to make money so there there are weddings are happening down there special events of one kind or another and one of the features is if you're holding an event at Mar-a-Lago there's a good chance Trump's going to come down you know and say a few words and he would do this and people would shoot with their with their iPhones. Uh, you know Trump talking and, and in, in, invariably and some of the stuff is still out there on online. Um, you know, Trump would be wishing the bride and the groom the best of luck and all that. And then within 30 seconds, he's talking about the cyber ninjas out in Arizona. You know, and he's talking about how they're going to overturn this and all that. And he's talking about all this other crazy stuff. I mean, yeah. I guess if you're getting married at Mar-a-Lago, you like that kind of thing. But, I, you know. It must be. <laughs> yeah. And, and you can see it. And usually it's up on the stage. The band is waiting to play. You know, the people want to dance. And, and he's talking about how, you know, man, it's going to be Arizona. And then they're going to do it in Georgia. And then we've done Wisconsin. And New Hampshire. A lot of really interesting things happening in New Hampshire. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people are saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So you give your – all your books um, uh, give – chapter and verse about, um, you know, that, that this, this is a man with serious mental instability. Um, he is a danger to democracy. Uh, he is a liar par excellence. One of the things you talked about in this book, which I had not seen reported anywhere else, was that he gave advice to Herschel Walker in his Senate campaign that he should just call his opponent a child molester. And Herschel Walker, believe it or not, demurred and said, well, but I don't have any evidence of that. He said, well, you just say that it happened on his watch. That's that's what you do. Just say it. Just um, say it. Not even that it happened on his watch. Just say it. Just say yeah. it. What, what's great is that that call is because is, is Trump likes calling people, obviously. So he's calling Herschel Walker, or Herschel Walker's phones off, and they're in the middle of a debate prep session. So like all of you know, the campaign people are there. And Walker puts yeah. on speakerphone so they all hear – <laughs> uh, saying this stuff. And so somebody told Jonathan Carl what transpired. All right. But um, so you have chapter and verse here about what kind of a sociopath we have on our hands. I mean, you tell that story about right after 9-11, long before he was president, right after 9-11, he was doing a radio interview. And, uh, you know, he says, yeah, terrible about the uh, terrible about all the death. Uh, I guess that means I have the tallest building in Manhattan now. <laughs> Um, you know, yeah. it, the mind boggles, the mind boggles. So, um, uh, so in light of you're all of having this, that thought in your head on that, day. no, I mean, we all, I, I mean, it is, and, and, and you're it, actually it, in New York. I mean, he, yeah. he was in New York at the time. Yeah, no, it is astounding. And it is such a sign of, of a morally degenerate person. So uh, my question lie. is classically. It's sorry. Also, it's also a lie, incidentally. Well, that's true. It's also a lie. He did, you know, so icing on the cake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, even, even, if, so even if it were true, it's like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, do you think um, that people have just uh, forgotten about these aspects of his character? Uh, they've, uh, or that they really don't care? Or that they like it. Where do you come down on this? Well, I, I think there there are a couple of things. One is I, I think that there are look, and I've over the years I've spent countless hours uh, at Trump rallies around Trump supporters. I mean, I've I covered the campaign in 2016. I covered all four years of the White House, the reelection campaign, and much of what he's been doing um, afterwards. And you know, you have. You do have people who are totally and thoroughly devoted to him, and no matter the, the kind of the shoot him on Fifth Avenue crowd, maybe that's those are the people that attend his rallies and 
for the most part. But you also have a, a larger segment of Republicans who don't like any of this stuff, but who um, – what they will tell you is, look, I, I wish he didn't do that. I wish he, you know, kept his mouth shut. But, you know, but, uh, you know, the kind of cliche is I like his policies, which, by the way, I think is something of a myth. We can talk about that, whether or not they're what, what exactly these Trump policies are. Um, yeah. But uh, but but the notion is, look, I don't like that stuff, but I thought he was a good president. The country was better off than it, was, than it is now under Biden. That's why I've come to terms with it. It's almost like they've I've come to terms with the fact that. He's got all these the, 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 this parts of his personality, um, the way he acts, the way he treats people that I just don't like. But, you know, nobody's perfect. Um, but I also think so. Those are two two groups of people. I think there's a there's a perhaps the largest of them all. In, in, in and in a big reason why I wrote Tired of Winning is people who have really m- memories of faded about what he was like in the White House, especially in that final year. And people didn't pay any attention at all to what he did after he left the White House. And, right. and in some ways, I make the case that he is, that all the tendencies that led to January 6th have actually actually accelerated after he left the White House. He's a little more divorced from reality. Um, his obsessions, his quest for vengeance and all of that, much greater after he left the White House. Um, the way I've put it is like January 6th was the end, not literally, but it was the, the coda of the Trump presidency. It's the beginning of a second Trump presidency, if there is one. And 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 people just haven't paid attention. Unless you were attending weddings at Mar-a-Lago, you didn't hear much from the guy over the last you know few years. Right. Okay. Does anybody else want to weigh in on this before we turn to another topic? Yeah. Bill Galston. First of all, you know, this this interview so far, you know, to seize the cliched adjective has been absolutely riveting. Uh, and uh, I will now go out and do what I should have done quite some time ago, and that is get and read the book. My apologies for not having done so up to now. Uh, but you strike me as an optimist, Jonathan, in the following sense, you know, And a subtext of what you just said is that people don't really know or they've forgotten. And if they're reminded, then surely they will turn against him. That's sort of the argument that I'm hearing. How sure are you of that? Uh, Because, you know, uh, I'm, you know, I've been a lifelong defender in theory and in practice of liberal democracy. But I'm beginning to wonder whether a substantial portion of the American electorate hasn't lost its capacity for what Catholics call moral discernment. What's your view of this? Well, um, Mark Leibich wrote a piece you probably saw in The Atlantic um, a couple months ago, um, kind of ridiculing the notion of this is not who we are. You know, the, the kind of cliched like that, you know, Trump's doing this. That's not who we are. That's not us. And he's like, well, maybe it is, <laughs> you know, I mean, how has he come back the way he has? But I, I, I do think that there is, as I said, a, a, a segment of the population that doesn't care about this stuff and is totally loyal to, to, uh, uh, uh to him, almost cult-like. Um, but I do think that there is a, a significant segment of the of, of the people who have even voted for him in these in these uh, you know in the first round of, uh, of, of of primaries, who um, you know aren't aware of all of this stuff. Um, and I am I am it is it is challenging. It is hard to be an optimist. I am an optimist. I um, one of the things that I um, kind of conclude with with betrayal, which is my, my previous book where I really tried to explain what happened in 2020 and and, and and what led to what led to January 6th. And as horrific as all of that was, we were prevented from a much greater crisis and maybe truly the end of American democracy by the courageous slash everyday 
uh, banal actions of people that were very close to Trump, who, who were ultimately unwilling to do what he demanded. And it's, you know, I mean, obviously, most famously, Pence on January 6th, but it's, but it's a lot more than that. It's the entire, you know, some of it's very well known, the, 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 uh, the leadership of the Department of Justice threatening to resign en masse uh, in early January. Um, you know, when, uh, when, when Trump's ready to put Jeffrey Clark in front in, you know, ahead of the, uh, of the Department of Justice and to use the power of DOJ uh, to try to overturn the election. It's all of them standing up. These are all Republicans. They were all appointed by Trump. They all supported Trump through all of that. Think of all that had already happened. And, and they, um, all of them, you know, did something again. Is it courageous or is it like, well, you would hope they would do that. It's both, I think. Um, the, the, the people that were running the, uh, the transition with the Biden uh, uh, team. You know, I described kind of a, of a clandestine operation run out of the, uh, the second floor of the West Wing. It's doing some of those things that you have to do to prepare for a transition, uh, the logistics of a transition. Um, there were people that were trying to thwart it around Trump, to be sure. But there were good people, again, Trump people, people brought in who had served Trump, including one guy I talk about had been there for all four years. Um, um, it's uh, Tony Arnato, uh, the Secret Service agent, become deputy chief of staff who was working with Jen O'Malley Dillon in, the, in those final you know, couple of weeks to facilitate a transition that Trump was actively trying to stop. Um, Again, they're doing what they're required to do by law, so it's hard to call it courageous because <laughs> they would have been breaking the law if they had done what Trump wanted them to do or acted in the way that Trump wanted them to act. Um, so, yeah, but, it, but I, 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 I have – I mean it, it, is, it is remarkable how resilient um, he has been given all that has gone down and the willingness of people to, to, to look the other way is, is hard to explain. Linda Chavez, you had a comment? Yes, actually, it was sort of a, a follow-up and, and a question to Jonathan, and that is, you know, I, I think you're right in describing the way in which um, some Republicans have behaved, and that was great. Uh, of course, we haven't seen very many examples of that recently. And my worry is that some of this, um, you know, willing to tolerate Trump um, I think you're right. A lot of people aren't paying attention and maybe they'll start paying more attention, particularly as mean, we talked about this uh, on the podcast last week and the role that Nikki Haley could play in, in helping Trump, you know, again, sort of implode, unravel, uh, be more uh, crazy uh, or at least give more sort of visible uh, examples of his craziness. But I also wonder whether, um, you know, one of the one of the issues isn't that. Biden uh, has such opposition and the Biden-Harris team has such opposition uh, among some of those independent, vo uh, independent voters and Republicans like myself, who I was a Republican then, not anymore, uh, who voted for Biden, that they feel that he really has... Um, has caved uh, to to the progressive wing. Now, you know, Bill will tell you that hasn't happened, and I probably agree with him, but it doesn't mean that, that there aren't a substantial number of American voters out there who think that the, the Biden administration are altogether too woke, um, that they've done things they don't like. Uh, and, you know, to what degree are those going to be the drivers uh, of the election? For sure, it's it, it's that it's that phrase that we kept on hearing in 2016, um, you know, from Republicans who had professed horror at the idea of Trump as the nominee and then came to support him. It's a binary choice. It's him or it's Hillary Clinton. Now it's it's him or it's 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 Joe Biden, and they've done a a remarkably effective job of vilifying Joe Biden. I, I didn't really think that was possible in the way they've done it, but they've. They've they've really um, they they've really turned him into this uh, you know uh, I mean it's like a flip side of the, the, you know the, he's the threat to democracy uh, and 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 you know look that there, there's been they, they've they've had material to work with I mean probably you know no no issue greater than the border I would say border and crime but but um, 
but crime rates are going down, not in Washington, D.C., but, um, but um, you know, and I would say inflation, but inflation has come down. But the border, the border is uh, – um, and, and you can tell the, 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 how important the issue is politically to them by the, the, ap- the absolute effort to block any, anything that would, that would reek of a, of a solution that, uh, that, uh, that, that Biden could take credit for. You know, the effort to tank the the, the agreement. Funny you should mention that, Jonathan, (laughs) because that is what I want to get to next. Unless, Damon, did you have anything or can we move on to – can we move on to the immigration battle? Well, I did want to say one one thing, if that's okay. Sure. Um, yes, I, please. I, I want to make sure everyone here is aware that I am not an optimist. Um, but uh, more seriously, <laughs> um, I, I did want to uh, you know point out um, to. to to people who agree uh, that with Jonathan, and I know there are a lot of people out there, and there's a part of my soul that inclines in this direction, the part of my soul that admires and loves the Enlightenment, and it's hope that there is knowledge that can be won and disseminated that will make the world a better place. And we hope that if somehow we wake everybody up to how bad Donald Trump is after everything we've been through, things will get better. Um, there was a poll um, – by the uh, Public Religion Research Institute, PRRI, uh, in October about uh, many issues, but one of them, one segment of the poll had to do with QAnon beliefs. Um, I just want to read a few results here. Among all Americans, 14% uh, believed in QAnon in 2021. By 2023, that number was 23 that's 14 to 23 percent. Republicans have gone in those two years from 23 to 29. Not, not that high of a, of a jump, uh, cause it was already on the high end, but among independents, 12 percent to 22 percent. Among Democrats, 7 percent to 14 percent. This is true across white evangelical Protestants, non-Christians, religiously unaffiliated white Catholics and Hispanic Catholics. All of them jumped uh, sometimes two and threefold in two years. And perhaps the most shocking bit of evidence or, or um, data of all, black Protestants, 13 percent f- support for QAnon to 26 in two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is from an older PRI poll, so it's the same outfit doing the, the data. I would just submit that we who are educated and like the Enlightenment and read about politics all the time, I fear increasingly that we have no frickin' clue <laughs> what is going on in the minds of not all Americans, maybe not even half of Americans, but a nice big old chunk of Americans – epistemologically that they they live in a reality we can't even imagine residing in and you know who else lives in that world is Donald Trump and he speaks their language and as long as negative partisanship is in effect convincing normie republicans that yeah I don't like him but Biden's really bad so I got to vote for the republican you have a coalition there that, as we saw in the polls uh, released this week from Morning Consult and uh, and Bloomberg, Trump's winning seven out of seven swing states. I mean, I, I don't like this, but, you know, the title of your book is, uh, you know, Tired of yeah. Winning. I mean, we're seeing a lot of winning so far relative to what I would expect. Um, so I, I'll, I'll shut up now, but um, I, I, I just sort of – I, I don't know what to do. I, I, I don't know what to do, but I, I'm at so, a loss. Any advice, thoughts on that? <laughs> Jonathan, um, before you respond, let me just level set for a second. Uh, Damon, did that poll um, define QAnon beliefs in any way, or did it just say, do you believe the QAnon is true? Uh, I don't have it in front of me. Were? I don't, I don't okay. recall the exact wording of the question. Okay, um, because that would matter. Okay, Bill, but you Bill is a, he to probably do with that knows because yeah, so Bill is Mr. Bill, Polster. You, well, not yeah, only then he he has uh, not only do I know, yeah. but in fact, the poll to which you referred, Damon, was the annual version of the American Values Survey, which has been a co-production of PRRI and the Brookings Institution, 
Brookings Institute. Right, right. and I was part of the team that wrote the survey instrument. Uh, so no, Great. it was it was not just uh, you know an abstract invocation of QAnon. A number of specific QAnon beliefs were explored. Oh, swell. And uh, okay, and laying out the specifics didn't seem to scare people away. <laughs> I regret to inform <laughs> okay. you. Okay, <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Well, Jonathan, uh, there you go. Ha- try being optimistic in the face of that. I dare you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a disinformation <laughs> contagion, and it's definitely. <sighs> It's 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 growing. Um, the, the, yeah. the, the, there, there's no question. And when when you have somebody who, is a, who can be as an effective communicator as he sometimes is, Donald Trump, you know, screaming it from the rooftops, um, it, it 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 it's gonna it's gonna spread faster. Um, yeah. And um, I mean, it's you don't have to go all Q and on. You can just, I mean, just, just, just the widespread belief that the election was stolen or yep. the increasingly widespread belief that January 6th was in Ramaswamy's words, uh, an inside job. Um, yeah. I mean, these are not events that are far off into the distance. Or a patriotic <laughs> display. Take your yeah. pick. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It was either, right. uh, it was either a false flag <laughs> FBI effort or it was just good old, you know, American tourists, uh, visiting the yeah. capital to express, uh, their, their love of the country. I don't. Uh, I don't usually wear the optimist hat, but um, let's talk a little bit about what's been happening in the politics of immigration, because I do think that you could um, make a case. So, if we were all gathered a month ago, and four of us were um, talking about the um, political effect of immigration on this race, we would have said, slam dunk, this is a huge advantage for the Republican Party, huge vulnerability for the Democrats and for Joe Biden. Um, Bill Galston in particular has been, you know, practically, uh, you know, waving semaphore flags saying that Biden has to do something about this and has to change his tone and so on. And in the last few weeks, arguably, we have seen the Republican Party really, you know, sacrifice its advantage by openly and and flagrantly saying that they want to tank a deal which gave them nearly everything they asked for. I mean, that that Senate negotiation with uh, a very conservative senator, uh, James Langford, uh was the lead negotiator on, and which he himself says uh, is is very tough, um, was was the sort of thing that um, you know basically it it had nothing for the Democrats, nothing about the Dreamers, nothing about it was all enforcement, hiring more uh, immigration judges, um, uh, you know, just right across the board, changing the asylum standards, doing all of these things, and suddenly. You have Republicans saying, and this was the uh, Speaker of the House, saying it's going to be dead on arrival. You had uh, Trump, of course, openly calling on Republicans not to support it. You have members saying, why would I give Biden a win in an election year? I'm not going to do that. And so suddenly, haven't they handed to Biden, if he has the wit to use it, uh, an opportunity to say, I am ready to get tough and to and to take action on the border and to do it the right way with Congress changing the law, which is necessary. And it is the Republicans who stand in the way. Linda, what do you think? I think that uh, Republicans see this as their best campaign issue. Uh, you know, they thought they might be able to win on the basis of inflation being too high and a lousy economy and, and, and all of that. And, you know, suddenly inflation is coming down. The economy is doing better. Wages are actually increasing, not greatly, but better than they did uh, during the Trump years, according to some uh, charts that I've seen recently. So obviously they they want to keep this as a, as a live issue. Now, I don't think that that is necessarily going to get uh, Biden out of the woods on this issue. So long as you see tens of thousands of people showing up at the border uh, and turning themselves in, claiming asylum, and a substantial number, about half, are actually released into the United States, uh, then you see, you know, governors like Abbott and and other Republicans shipping those people 
uh, usually to cities like Chicago or San Francisco or New York, it's going to be an issue. So I think that Biden is probably going to have to do something unilaterally. And the question is, what can he do? What are his options? I mean, one of the things that um, critics that I hear from uh, suggests is that he has been too quick to release people. You know, why are half of all of those uh, claiming asylum being released? Uh, why not, um, particularly if you're talking about single men who show up, uh, it's a little bit harder, I think, with families. Uh, but, you know, the, there were more detention beds uh, available under the Trump administration. You know, COVID uh, changed that somewhat. They had to, uh, they had to eliminate some because of the, the dangers uh, in terms of spreading the disease. But I think he's going to have to come up with some solutions that, that are not going to be popular among progressives. I'm not going to like them because, you know, I'm uh, very much an advocate for immigrants. But politically, I think he's got to be shown as being strong. And then, you know, we'll see whether the Republicans can continue to make it an, an issue. You know, when he's come up with solutions in the past, he took the Venezuelan situation. When we had tens of thousands of Venezuelans going through the Darien uh, Gap, coming up through Central America and Mexico, showing up on the border, along with Haitians, Cubans, and others. Uh, and, and, you know, people were outraged. I mean, we saw lots of pictures last spring and summer. He came up with an idea of paroling some of these individuals, giving them access to be able to apply uh, to come into the United States through uh, an app on their phone, showing up not in between ports, but at, uh, at ports of entry, being processed there. And immediately the numbers dropped. I mean, it was like overnight the numbers dropped. Now, what did the Republicans do? They went into court and sued to try to stop him from having that authority. And one of the things that's being debated in this bill is to try to limit his authority. So the question is going to be, can Biden do things um, unilaterally uh, that uh, are going to have some, are going to make some difference and get rid of some of the pictures that we're seeing now, because those pictures will continue to be run uh, in campaign ads. Okay, so Linda, I have a question. The, the Republicans claim that um, they say Biden is not enforcing the laws on the books now. Why should we give him another law? But is that right? My understanding is that because of our asylum law, which is completely um, um, misapplied, well, it's, it's inappropriate for our current needs. It's currently uh, situated. It was passed in 1980 in a different world, and now it's being abused, <clears throat> and it requires a change in the law. Isn't he required by the law as it stands to give everybody who comes and claims asylum a hearing, which means that, you know, his hands are Absolutely. a little bit tied, yeah. no, right? And the, the problem is that if you want to claim asylum, under current law, the only way you can do that is by being in the United States. And, and that's why these people show up. Yeah. You know, it isn't like they're sneaking through the border and hiding in the bushes and not wanting an encounter. Nope. No, they, write, write, they walk right up to the CPB agent uh, and turn themselves in and say, I want to claim asylum. Uh, the rules in terms of um, what allows them to claim asylum are also a little bit fuzzy. You know, they have to show a credible fear. Uh, and the agents who first encounter them do not have a whole lot of authority in that. So I think that those are some of the kinds of changes. Come up with somewhat tightened standards, make sure that uh, we don't do you mean yeah. through rulemaking? Well, You're saying no, Biden I think can do this probably through rulemaking. have to be Look, whenever he tries to do anything by rulemaking, he has done these things by rulemaking, and they sue him. So, okay. uh, you know, now maybe if arguably right. if he's doing it to tighten the rules, maybe they won't sue. But I don't really, you know, I, I, I don't have that much faith in, in the Republicans and their, uh, and their motives in this. So, so I, think, I think there do have to be changes in the law. The other thing is that one of the things that made the Venezuela policy work and one of the things I think that would make asylum work better is instead of saying you just have to step foot on American soil and you've got a year 
after stepping foot on American soil to present yourself and claim asylum, that if you tightened that up a bit and made it that you had to come through a port of entry and you had to present yourself immediately, that, you know, coming in and and being in the shadows for a year and, and coming forward at the last minute, that leaves a, a lot of problems for loopholes. And But then you also have to make sure that you have enough immigration judges to be able to judge those claims. And if not, immigration judges to come up with a system. Mm -hmm. But Linda, I know, this of is course, in the bill. I know that. This is yes, in this I legislation. Know, I know. Okay, <clears throat> it's all in there. And the Republicans are the ones who are saying no. All right, Bill, I'm coming to you. Let me just read you this quote from James Langford. Again, very right-wing uh, Republican senator. Well-respected, or as he says ruefully now, formerly well-respected by his colleagues. Um, quote, so we actually locked arms together and said, we're not going to give you money for this. We want a change in law. He's talking about their relations with the administration. When we're finally going to the end, um, they're like, and now he's talking about his fellow Republicans. Oh, just kidding. I actually don't want a change in law because it's a presidential election year. Unquote. And then he says, we all have an oath to the Constitution and we have a commitment to say we're going to do whatever we can to be able to secure the border. So, Bill, I know you've been harsh about Biden on this, but honestly, Republicans have been saying we have to hold up aid for Ukraine. We have to hold up aid for Israel. We can't do anything for Taiwan because we have a dire emergency at our own border. And now they're saying no. We don't, we don't want to solve the problem because it might help Biden. If you'd like my moral judgment, you know, this is outrageous. If you'd like my political judgment, I'm afraid I'm going to have to give you a different answer. And here it okay. is, and it's a blunter version of Linda's answer. Okay? Uh, in the last year of the Trump administration, under 500,000 people presented themselves in any of the forms and ways. That was covid that was under COVID. Okay, Linda, I uh, rather Mona. Fine. Okay. First year of the Biden administration, 1.7. Second year, 2.4. Fiscal year just ended, uh, 2.5. I did an interview with an official of the Migration Policy Institute late last week. The total for the first quarter of fiscal 2024 is 785,000. Project that out for a full year, and that's yeah. 3.1 million. That's what people yeah. are paying attention to, darn it. And yes. The, and the, okay, idea, then, and the idea, look, this is very cynical politics that the Republicans are playing. But unfortunately, uh, you know, the old Dale Carnegie Maxim, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And yeah, I may sound harsh, but I think I'm right. I speak as an ardent proponent of Joe Biden's reelection. The administration has blown this issue for three years. Now suddenly they've gotten religion. I'm an ardent proponent of the compromise bill that is taking much too long to see the light of day, by the way. If this had seen the light of day two months ago, we'd be in a different position. But now that now that Trump is the presumptive nominee, he can push his party around. Uh, you know, I was about to say, don't get me started, but clearly you have. Uh, you know, <laughs> so many missed opportunities in the past three years. And now we're in a situation, I'm afraid, where the American people, the ones who are genuinely malleable, are going to pay attention to only one thing. Not the process, not the politics, but the results. And if this, the administration, through one way or another, uh, can show real measurable results between now and November, they will gain from that. And if they don't, I don't think all the banging away on the political cynicism the Republicans are now displaying is going to make a darn bit of difference. Jonathan Carl, do you think that Biden can do anything unilaterally to change the perception here? Well, look, I, I... And I don't just mean on the border. I mean also messaging. Not just the substance, but also the messaging. You know, I mean, 
clearly you make the case that you have been trying to do something the Republicans have stopped you. You make that case as forcefully as you can. But I, I agree with Bill. He's the president of the United States. He's been president for three years. Uh, the, the, the buck is going to stop with the president. And he can't just say, you know, the, those, those people in Congress wouldn't let me get it done. Um, you know, what, what he, he, so I, I think that the substance is going to win over, uh, the, the, the battle over process here. Uh, I, I know that there is some frustration among some of the president's allies that he hasn't done more already in terms of, uh, executive action, uh, to make changes at the border. Uh, but I mean, look, we're 6 million plus, uh, 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 that, that, that have, that have crossed so far uh, under under President Biden, I think it's going to be very hard to change the messaging on on, on this one and to change the the substance of the policy. Could I just jump uh, in here, Mona? Because you know the six million number and even uh, Bill's numbers of you know two million, two and a half million, etc., three million now, those are encounters at the border. Not all of those are individuals. Some of them are repeats, and not all of those people actually end up being led into the United States. Now, clearly there are also others who get in who never encountered the Border Patrol, but uh, we have to be careful when we, and I'll talk about it in my highlight of the week, we have to be a little careful about assuming that 5 million illegal immigrants are suddenly in the United States. Not not quite accurate. But you're not claiming that the metric has changed. No, I'm not. Absolutely not. No, the, we, we've been measuring well, the same but, way. Know. And you're right, Bill. There has been this huge increase. But as I like to remember I like to remind people, when Donald Trump ran for office in 2016, we were at the lowest point in legal Im illegal immigration to the United States in 50 years. And he was able to make it an issue then and win on that issue, even though we had nothing like a crisis at the time. So a lot of this is driven by things other than actual numbers and what the real impact is of, of these folks coming into the U.S., uh, okay, Damon, a um, couple things. Uh, one, um, we, you know, we have seen in American history, maybe not within living memory for most of us, but uh, uh, Harry Truman was able to run against a do-nothing Congress. He was able to make an issue of the fact that uh, they were unwilling to give him what he asked for. Uh, it's not like it cannot be done, but, um, but the other side of this, of course, is that this is a textbook display, isn't it, of um, Congress being unwilling to do its job, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's been this way for 40 years. Congress has not wanted to legislate. And so we keep dancing around and, and you know, our capacity to grandstand has never been greater and our capacity to actually legislate seems like it's atrophied. Oh, of course. Absolutely. Uh, Congress uh, basically exists to share responsibility. Uh, people in Congress want to get reelected and they've learned that if they do very little, then there's not much that uh, voters can say to, to say they should be kicked out. So they try to kick all cans down the road. It happens in foreign policy all the time. I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, refusal to weigh in, sort of deferring to the executive branch and letting presidents do what they want. And it's true in many issues as well. But it's also a function of divided public opinion. We are a very divided uh, country. And and immigration is one of the worst there is out there. You have, you have a, a segment of the population that doesn't want a single additional person coming over the border. Then on the opposite side, you have people on the left who don't, hardly anyone on the left is explicitly in favor of open borders, but effectively would like free movement of peoples within some kind of reasonable limit who are effectively at the opposite pole from the first group. And then in the middle, you have a lot of people who either want to adjust it a little or are kind of happy with where it is, but they also thermostatically shift based on who's in the White House. So if Trump's in the White House, those people lurch in the more pro-immigration direction because they hate Trump. 
and they feel like he's a fascist and they don't want to be associated with that at all and they want a different vision of America. So they become much more liberal on immigration. Then Biden comes in and you see images of chaos on the border and they move over and start to become much more skeptical. And now they're sort of kind of more skeptical of open immigration. And that is a perfect recipe if you then combine it with the fact that the margin between the parties in Congress is like three people, <laughs> four people, where and, you know, and, and effectively nothing gets through unless you have, you know, unanimity of the party that has a three or four vote majority. I mean, that's that's an incredibly narrow needle to thread. It's so hard. And then you add in that dimension of the the forces in public opinion. Um, it, it's effectively like may render self-government nearly impossible. And I, and then and then the last factor of all is the timing in the election cycle. And now that we are within a year of a presidential election where immigration is a major topic, a major issue, I just don't see anything happening. Um, I, I agree with you, Mona, that it's pretty, you know, cynically despicable what the, what the Republicans are, are, uh, doing now, especially after just a few months ago, they were imploring Biden to like come to the table. Let's have a deal. And everyone seemed eager to do it. Now they're all running scared because Trump is commanding them not to give Biden any victories. But then again, politics ain't beanball. And this is not an era of beanball. <laughs> It's an era of extremely harsh hardball, and uh, and I'm afraid that's where we are. And Biden is going to have to to ride this tiger. He maybe has traded, you know, uh, a kind of bad vibe over the economy for now bad vibes over the border. Um, the, the thing that hasn't changed is a lot of Americans appear pretty grumpy about wanting to blame Biden for something. I, I, I would just make two very quick points based on what you just said. First of all, for all the reasons you went through, this is by far the tough uh, – this is a tougher, more comprehensive uh, bill than Trump would be able to sign if he got back into the White House. There's no way that something Correct. like this passes with, 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 with Trump in the White House. Um, even if the Republicans take over both, both chambers, there's no way it could oh, spell that out, Jonathan. That's oh, because wait, the Democrats wait, wouldn't wait, agree, right? Because the, 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 no, no Democrats. I mean, Manchin exactly. will be gone by then. I mean, no Democrats. Uh, right. Cinema may be gone exactly. by then. I mean, it, it, it's it's yeah. it, it'll be it'll be a total wall of, 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 of resistance, not a extension of the wall at the border. The, the other thing is um, I just 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 a, just a quick comment, which is. The dysfunction in this Congress is actually greater. I mean, it, yes, it's a four. It, 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 this is this is nothing new in American history to see this kind of stuff, but 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 this Congress is, and and you guys are, you guys have the numbers. You guys are the experts. But I mean, this seems to be a new level of of dysfunction, which to me, I I I wonder when you're when you're when you're Biden and you're the Democrat and, and you're making the case that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy, which I think is a very powerful and important case to make. I wonder if it's a little harder to make when American democracy has produced what we are watching right now on Capitol Hill. Bill, you wanted to make a point? Just very quickly, uh, I think it's worth remembering that we wouldn't be having any of this discussion about immigration if the pillar of Joe Biden, Biden's foreign policy, namely Ukraine, weren't depending, weren't linked to it and dependent upon it. This is a very special set of circumstances. Uh, and, you know, uh, otherwise there, uh, otherwise I think there would have been no move towards bipartisan discussions in the Senate. Well, but it is also um, even more underlines the point that both Damon and Jonathan are making, which is this is a whole new level of dysfunction. I mean, we are purportedly a world leader uh, that is so wrapped around its own axle that we cannot get aid to our, you know, very important allies in the world at a time of desperate need. That's a new level. I of think we're all begging to agree to that proposition. Yeah, about that. <laughs> no doubt yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, before we turn to our final segment, I want to say a word about Miracle Made. So if you're one of those people who finds your sheets are scratchy and uncomfortable, 
Um, and if you find that you wake that that you're waking up because your body is the wrong temperature, either too hot or too cold, um, you might want to check out Miracle Made bed sheets. Uh, inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding, so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. It has self cooling properties for better sleep. It uses silver, it, as I said, silver infused fabrics inspired by NASA. Miracle Made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature. And they are also self-cleaning. Well, you do wash them, but they have the silver that's in them prevents 99.7% of bacterial growth and allows them to stay cleaner and fresher longer. They are very comfortable and smooth, uh, not those scratchy sheets that you sometimes might have in your house uh, and without the high price tag of other luxury brands. So... Go to trymiracle.com slash beg to differ. That's trymiracle.com slash beg to differ to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use your promo beg to differ at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash beg to differ and use the code beg to differ to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash beg to differ to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. All right, we now come to our final segment, our highlight or low light of the week. And Damon, let's start with you. Well, uh, the the only thing that keeps me uh, from despairing uh, in my pessimism is um, – uh, listening to music, reading good novels, things like this in my spare time. Uh, so I'm going to plug a novel today. Uh, I've been reading uh, Paul Auster's novel called Baumgartner. Uh, this has been out for a few months. Uh, it's about 200 pages long, so not a, a huge read, uh, read, not a big commitment, but it's a very, very good book. Uh, it's about... Uh, a, uh, a kind of mid, middle, middle-aged uh, philosophy professor at Princeton. He's a, a professor that focuses on phenomenology, and there's a kind of phenomenological uh, character of this novel because it's a lot of it takes place uh, in Baumgartner's head as he reflects on his life, uh, the death of his wife uh, at a sadly young age, and his dealing with that grief, but also reflecting on their past together. And then it goes back to his youth uh, and then forward to a relationship after the death of his wife and then back again. Uh, it, it's very much a stream of consciousness novel, uh, but it's it's thoughtful and deep and soulful and uh, very much recommended. It's a, a very good read. Thank you very much. Linda. Well, I would uh, share what I'm reading, but it is so depressing. Um, it is. <laughs> I'm rereading the Brothers Karamazov. I mean, if you want to get depressed, reread the Brothers Karamazov. So I'm not going to share that. But what I am going to share are a couple of uh, pieces on immigration because I think they made important uh, points. One of them is actually just from a couple of weeks ago, and it was from the New York Times. It was one of their opinion videos. And it's entitled, Things Fall Apart, How the Middle Ground on Immigration Collapse. And if you want to see something to really make you depressed in terms of uh, what, uh, you know, what it is that we used to be like on the immigration issue and how, how much we have really changed on that, I recommend that. But the second piece is one that I think is very important. And uh, I, I mentioned it because we talked about the numbers and how many people are actually coming into the United States and settling. And I think most people would be surprised to hear that until 2022, the actual stock of illegal immigrants living in the United States remained absolutely steady. Uh, actually, it had gone down 
uh, from the high point. There were about uh, 10.3 million people. And then it ticked up um, somewhat. And But in 2022, those numbers ticked up by 650,000, which is not nothing. That's, that, that is um, a real increase. This is a study uh, that was put out in his... Um, available on the Journal on Migration and Human Security. It's available online. It's called, After a Decade of Decline, the U.S. Undocumented Population Increased by 650,000 in 2022 by Robert Warren of the Center for Migration Studies. So I would recommend that. Um, It does show that numbers are going up, but they're not quite as dramatic as people on the right would have us believe. Okay, Jonathan Carl. Well, I would uh, say my low, I'll do a low light and it's Sunday, but that's the first day of the week. So I can do that. Right. Uh, seeing the yes. Detroit Lions and the Ravens lose, uh, I, 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 we're preparing for the Super Bowl. I did not want to watch. And the, the the corollary to that is to have to hear all the madness on the uh, on the QAnon right uh, about Taylor Swift and and uh, and Travis Kelsey. Uh, for another couple of weeks. Um, just, just, just disheartening. Yes. Okay. Bill Galson. Well, I, I'd say, you know, enduring a Super Bowl that you don't want to watch will be excellent preparation for covering this year's presidential. (laughs) Bingo. That's good. Yes. Uh, but I actually have some good news and that is that, uh, the European Union managed to twist Viktor Orban's arm into agreeing for $50 billion, I'm sorry, $54 billion in aid for Ukraine. This is, uh, to edit our president slightly, a big deal. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and not just in dollars, because the EU got this money freed up uh, without major concessions to Orban. There were some cosmetic conceptions, small changes of language, but basically he threw in the towel and uh, it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. And, uh, and so we've now dealt with half of the Ukraine funding problem. Uh, and the other half, I'm, I'm afraid, is on us. And uh, yeah. I'm getting decreasingly confident that we're going to be able to figure out a way to get to yes on that. Um. Bill, this does come almost hard on the heels of uh, another uh, strong man getting uh, his comeuppance, uh, or at least caving, uh, and that was Erdogan of Turkey finally gave up his objections to having Sweden join NATO. So that's uh, we're now two for two on the overruling yeah. strongman. Although in Erdogan got some very substantial concessions in return. Yes, that including is true. long stalled weapon systems. So he was yeah, a lot more expensive yeah, to systems. buy off than Orban. <laughs> um, but it wasn't a principled uh, cave. So it was just money. All right. Um, well, I uh, would like to, what shall I make this a highlight or a low light? It is um, a highlight because it's kind of weirdly entertaining, but that is watching the. Uh, ultra right MAGA world lose its mind over Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. Um, you know, they're always looking for a, um, uh, you know, a pop star or, or some sort of uh, cultural issue to, to fight a culture war about. And so usually it's, you know, Black Lives Matter or, you know, they went after uh, Colin Kaepernick and, and, and all of that. And, and you can understand that. I mean, that's going to agitate maybe lots of people on your side. But choosing to go after the most popular pop star in the world, <laughs> plus her all-American boyfriend who's going to the Super Bowl, is the height of stupidity. And, uh, and of course, it illustrates the thinking process among these people who say things like Jesse Waters, Fox News. He said that, that Taylor Swift is a Pentagon PSYOP asset. Okay, so it's all been cooked up by the Pentagon. He said, have you ever wondered how or why she blew up like this? Hmm, well... Around four years ago, the Pentagon Psychological Operations Unit floated turning Taylor Swift into an asset during a NATO meeting. And he goes on. So, and and all of these lunatics, Jack Posobiec of 
Pizzagate fame and Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, Laura Loomer, all of these people, even Sean Hannity, uh, who warned Taylor not to endorse Joe Biden. He said, think twice about that. Um, they are all losing their minds um, going after it. And they say now that the Super Bowl has been rigged so that it, they, there can be a great celebration of this couple and that they will then endorse Biden. And uh, so that, you know, all of the people in the know have to be prepared for this, that it's all been uh, rigged and, uh, and, and orchestrated. So, look, I, it is, there have always been people like this. There have always been loonies. And, you know, they used to get newsletters, you know, that came in the mail. And now they are at the very centers of American power. Now they are friends of the Republican nominee, likely Republican nominee for president who was president, and they control huge swathes of the media. And uh, that's the world we're all forced to live in. Uh, but I do think that the good news side of this is um, – they really have bitten off more than they can chew this time. I mean, going after these guys uh, is uh, a pretty boneheaded uh, move. And with that, I want to thank our guest, Jonathan Carl. Highly recommend all of his books, the most recent one, Tired of Winning, uh, and of course, my regular panel. And I would also like to mention our wonderful producer, Jim Swift, and our sound engineer, Jonathan Siri. And we will return next week as every week.